Thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Rachel Nelson, Director of the Institute of the Arts and Sciences at UC Santa Cruz, and with my collaborator, Gina Dent, co-organizer of the Visualizing Abolition Initiative. Today, we are thrilled to have theater director, performer, and activist, Rodessa Jones, and dancer and choreographer, Sarah Crowell, join us. For those of you who are new to Visualizing Abolition, these talks are part of an ongoing initiative generously supported by the Mellon Foundation, which also includes film screenings, art exhibitions, a music program, undergraduate classes, dissertation workshops, and more, giving sustained attention to the role of the arts in the movement for prison abolition. The past talks, music videos, and exhibition documentation can be found at visualizingabolition.ucsc.edu, and we'll put that in the chat for you. We look forward to today's conversation with Rodessa Jones and Sarah Crowell to think more about the role of theater and performance in imagining and creating a world in which our social problems are not answered with punishment and cages. Sarah has graciously agreed to speak with Rodessa about her over 40 years working with incarcerated women, and I'll introduce Sarah now and have her tell you a little bit about her work, why she's ideal for this task, and then she will introduce Rodessa. Gina will be here later to moderate audience questions, so do add any questions that you do have into the Q&A as we go along. So Sarah Crowell is a dancer and choreographer who's taught dance, theater, mindfulness, and violence prevention for over 35 years. At the end of 2020, she left her position as the artistic director at the Destiny Arts Center in Oakland, where she served in different capacities, including executive director, for 30 years. She co-founded and directed the Destiny Arts Youth Performance Company, which was the subject of two documentary films and won the National Arts and Humanities Youth Program uh, Award. Sarah has facilitated local and national arts integration, violence prevention, cultural humility, and team building professional development sessions with artists and educators since 2000. She's also the recipient of many awards, and really we're so very thrilled to have her. Sarah, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. What a, what an honor to be here, everyone. It's so good that you're here. I wish I could see you and sit in a circle with you. Um, that's such a, a long introduction. I'm just tired. I'm tired just listening to the whole 30 years worth of work. Um, but I'm not tired enough to be in the amazing presence of Rodessa Jones, who I'll be introducing to you in just in just a few minutes. But before we begin anything, um, I just want to give you a visual description of me. Um, I'm a light skinned black woman. I have very short salt and pepper hair, a little more pepper right now. Um, I also have uh, black spiral earrings, a satin bomber, white bomber jacket and a black shirt and black rimmed glasses, eyeglasses. And before we do anything, and this is my practice with through my work at Destiny Arts Center, I'm gonna invite everyone to do a short mindfulness exercise. So just, if you can, um, sit up nice and tall, wherever you're seated, or if you're standing, lengthen your spine, whatever works for you, and let's all collectively take a breath. And just gently lower or close your eyes. An invitation to just focus in on your breath. Just notice it. Notice the way your breath moves your body. Notice if it changes as you notice it. And notice your feet on the ground. And just for a moment, acknowledge the, one who, the ones whose land this was and that it was taken from them. Feel the generosity of the land and also the trauma and give something to it in this moment with your breath, with your body, with your heart. As we explore the intersection of the arts, abolition and performance, let us be grounded and present. And finally, a quote to meditate on by Angela Davis from her book, Abolition Dem Democracy Beyond Empire Prisons 
and torture. She says, the challenge of the 21st century is not to demand equal opportunity to participate in the machinery of oppression. Rather, it is to identify and dismantle those structures in which racism continues to be embedded. And she also says, you have to act as if it were possible to radically transform the world. And you have to do it all the time. And with that invitation, that radical invitation, let's all take another breath together. <sighs> and if your eyes aren't open yet, gently open them. And I also, I have another invitation. I'm just gonna have you gently stand. And academics, and academics sometimes we don't um, stand and move our bodies, but to learn anything, what I understand as a mover, as a theater person, as a youth educator, an arts educator, I know that our bodies are part of doing this work. And so I say, there's got to be movement in movements for social justice. So invitation to stand, and I wish I could see you, but that's okay, because I can feel you. And just ground your feet and just bounce a little bit. Maybe like add your hips to it, just add your hips. I like to say, and Rodessa actually reminded me yesterday that I like to say that my hips, this is where it all started. So you might as well just move it around a little bit, move it around a little bit, move your body. That's right, I can feel it, I can feel it. Bounce it out a little bit, shake it out. I know you've been sitting in front of your Zooms. Bless you for joining again this evening. And then I'm gonna invite you to take your left foot back and put your hands up like this and then pull your fingers back and pull your elbows back slightly. And this is a martial arts move, it's called a palm heel strike. And you're just gonna strike from the back. So that's your, your left hip and your left hand pushing forward. That's right, pull it out and back really fast. And right now, all together, we're gonna imagine things we wanna say no to. What do we wanna abolish? What do we wanna let go of? What, we, what do we want to struggle with to end? And we're gonna say no four times. I'll say one, two, three. We'll all say no and throw that that palm heel strike out. One, two, three. No, one, two, three. No, one, two, three. No, one, two, three. No. All right, shake it out, shake it out. Now switch legs. And again, hands up. Good. Nice low stance, right? If you haven't started to move yet and you're able, jump in it. You can do this. If you're, if you're not moving, you're feeling in to now your yes. What do you want to say yes to? What do you want to build? What do we want to build together? As a person who teaches young people, I always say there's a no and there's a yes in everything. So let's say yes to something with our other hand. One, two, three. Yes. One, yes. two, three. Yes. yes. One, two, three. Yes. yes. One, two, three. Yes. Good. Shake it out. Shake it out. Shake it out. Shake it out. And then gently come back to your screen. And let's all take a breath. Ah, oh, Odessa, thank you for breathing back there. So um, I'm going to say a little bit about my work and um, before I invite Rodessa in. For me, Rodessa is so much of a part, so much part of the work that I've done and created at Destiny Art Center. And so it is my deep, deep honor to be on this stage um, with her um, and, and be in conversation. To me, she's an elder in the in the movement, an innovator in the movement of telling stories through, through theater and dance and political commentary and really telling stories from the heart, really gritty stories, right? And she does them with incarcerated women and has done with many adults all over the world. I have done them specifically with teenagers at Destiny Art Center here in Oakland, California. And um, Destiny Art Center is a is a nonprofit um, youth arts organization, and the mission of Destiny Art Center is to inspire and ignite social change through the arts. And I'm sorry, I'm looking over here at my other screen because I'm going to show you just a quick video that gives you kind of an idea of the work we do at Destiny. Um, our teen dance theater company, which is not our only program, but that's the program that I started um, 30 years ago 
and that Rachel was saying um, won some awards and was in documentaries. But to me, what's most important about the work is that it comes straight from the heart and it tells stories. And I think that's why Rodessa is my role model because that's what she's been doing for 40 years. So here is a little taste of destiny. This is called Say Their Names from a show called Seed Language produced in 2016. Ayanna Stanley Jones, Pearl Underwood, Miriam Carey, Yvette Smith, Tanisha Anderson, Shelley Frey, Darnisha Harris, Melissa Williams, Alicia Thomas, Chantel Davis, Rakia Boyd, Cherise Francis, and Renisha McBride. These are all women who have been killed by the state. There are thousands more who are missing, disappeared, murdered, or simply forgotten. Black Lives Matter often gets framed as a movement that aims to save the lives of black men. And it's true. Black men are disproportionately impacted by incarceration, disproportionately impacted by police murder, but we are here too. Black women are the fastest growing population in prisons and jails in this country. There are more than one million women who are behind bars. And when we talk about women, especially women of color, specifically black women, you should know that we are holding together the broken tatters of a broken economy and a broken democracy. And let us not forget the many, 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 many indigenous women who have been disappeared, who are holding their families together on a shoestring, if that. And we carry the burden of inequality poverty, lack of access to healthcare resources. We carry that on our backs, and we certainly carry that in our wombs. That is, um, again, from a piece called Seed Language, which was a collaboration between Destiny Art Center and a also Bay Area-based dance theater company called The Embodiment Project. And that actually happened right as the Black Lives Matter movement was really beginning to have some momentum. And what we did was we gave our students, our teen students, access to people who were activists in the movement so that they could interview them and embody them. So the young woman who's standing in front, Jessica, is embodying Alicia Garza, one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. And quickly, uh, another very short video it's called Dear Racism, and it's written by the young people who are performing it. And I'll just play it for you. Dear Racism, it's me. The, the young girl who others don't really get to see because you place this negative blinding label on me. Dear Racism, you scare me. Not only are you capable of turning other races against me, but you are powerful, powerful enough to brainwash my own race to turn their backs on me. They can take just one good look at my dark chocolate crafted face and call me a disgrace because my color pigmentation is richer and more decadent than their imaginations can handle. I was born with a voice as if there was a microphone tucked between my teeth. A secret that they, they do not want me to know. Dear racism, I hate you with your separatist ways. You had many people fooled, thinking that we have progressed over the years. And others, they just turned a blind eye because they let their fears get the best of their judgment. Looking back in their review mirrors thinking, look how far we've come. come. When in reality, the past is lurking. Oozing line. Creeping up on them. In fact, the past has never really left them. 
I was born with a voice that has traveled through waves of water and echoed across mountaintops, loud enough for future generations to hear. Dear racism, you, you are, are a master of I'm disguise and deception. deception. The same old things are still happening in minority communities, roping us off together, together to slowly kill each other. Although the name might have changed, the ghetto you boxed us in. You now want to take back with your new fancy word, gentrification. But let you tell it, it's just community beautification. I was born with a voice that has traveled through waves and water and echoed across mountaintops loud enough for future generations to hear. We know that race is a social construct. There is no scientific proof of it. But we further it. All of us do. Dear racism, I am not a puzzle piece you can move around to make things fit for you. There's a lot more to me than just my skin. I am not your expectations. I refuse to be another statistic to your racist logistic. I refuse to let you dictate me. I refuse to let you ruin my beauty with your hatred. Racism, it's us. Letting you know that we're smarter than you, we're stronger than you, and we will beat you. This little girl with hands and a big heart will not be quiet any longer. Dear racism, I was born with a voice and I intend to use it. Come on now. Mm. Mm. This to me is the legacy, the, the, the young people that are the voices from the work that Rodessa has done. And it just brought up this story that I wanna tell before I introduce Rodessa who said the other day, um, what did she say? She said, you have a right to a life. This is what she says to the women that she works with. You have a right to a life. Your individual stories are part of a collective. And, and another quick story, I mean, that to me, I could marinate on that for quite some time. I had the privilege in 1997 of meeting Asata Shakur in Cuba, um, who was a panther who was accused wrongly of murder and then escaped prison and, has, and is still in Cuba. And when I saw her, I was very like, oh my God, like, to me, it was like meeting another piece of my heart. And I was probably in my early 30s at the time. And when I met her, I, all I could do was cry. And she held me. She said, why are you crying? I said, but you mean so much to me. I read your book when I was 15. And, and, and my mother's last name is Shakur because of you. And I played your daughter in a dance piece. Like it, it was so meaningful to me to meet her. And she said come here and she just opened her arms and she said and she held me and she whispered in my ear she says the next time you come to cuba we'll talk and to me rodessa is like a sata to me and i get to talk to her so i'm going to introduce her with a video because to me movers and shakers um deserve to have movement as introduction so here's rodessa between the bucket and the water at the bottom of the well, against the crocodile's belly where the river rocks swell, number eight of 12, a mother before she was a woman, real talk for show, still black in Frisco, an actress, teacher, niece, great-grandmother, singer, conjurer, word wielder, sometimes working on the tip of the blade, sometimes in a cage, Call, response, improvise, transform. Rodessa Jones is Harriet Storm, the co-artistic director of the San Francisco-based theater company Cultural Odyssey and the founding director of the Medea Project, Theater for Incarcerated Women, our influencer, our respected wisdom giver, our thought leader, our divine inspiration, Miss Rodessa Jones. Rodessa, <laughs> welcome, sweet sister, mother, auntie, mentor. Thank you for joining Thank me in this you. conversation. Can you hear me? Yes, I okay, can hear good. you. Oh, thank you so much for all that you do and you give. And as you were telling 
a story and you showed us the work with young people, I flashed on an event that happened to me about three or four years ago, returning from Jamaica. And uh, I was uh, coming back into the country in Miami and there was about six young brown black people. They were probably 16, 18 years old and they loved my t-shirt. I had a t-shirt on that said, the black woman is God. And they said, oh, that t-shirt is tight. You know, they, they, were, they want to be careful because they want to be respectful because obviously I was much older, but I gave them a big smile and I kind of got in line ahead of them. And out of my eye, I see this good old boy who fancies himself a pastor, a reverend, big red, white man, and he's watching me. Mm. And he sidles over and he, and he demands to know, what does this, this t-shirt mean? And I turn, excuse me, and he says, I want you need to tell me what does this mean? And at that very moment, the children were there. Mm. Six young people, they were there, they stepped up and one little brother said, man, she ain't got to tell you nothing. <laughs> Back up, man. And my heart just opened and they mm. just beamed at me and they just stood behind, they, they, they gave me the look like, we ain't leaving you. We, got, we don't cut the line. We are standing here with you. And it's so wonderful as I, as I was witnessing, you're talking about the work you've done with Destiny Arts. And I think about the power of those young people. And here we are, here we are, here we dealing, are. With the, you know, dealing with abolition and, and our children are so informed, you know, they're not having it. It, it has got to be, it has got to be erased, moved over, moved away, and it is time for a new day. That's you right. And, and I mean, and to be in collaboration yes. with the young people, you know, people think, oh, let the young people have their voice and let them tr speak truth to power. But they were standing next to you yes. as you made this claim. And in a way, like, like, I love that you said that, like, that t-shirt and you told that story because it's similar to me to the idea of abolition, right? It's yes. like what Angela Davis is saying. It's like uh, my kids performed um, as like the warm up act for a, a, an engagement that Angela Davis was doing. She was speaking about abolition, mm -hmm. and and what what um, Angela was saying was, it's not that we we're going to necessarily see the abolition of prisons in our lifetime, but we need to vision for what it, what would we need to do to get there yes. for them to be obsolete, right? Yes. And that just gets it's like if if we have the elders with the young people across those generations doing those collaborations, we there's nothing we cannot do, you know. Yes. And, I mean, and we have arrived. I think when I think about even the pandemic and how it has like brought us all inside in our heads. And I still do a lot of work on Zoom. And I and when I am in the streets, I talk a lot to young people and they're wide open. They wanna know, they're looking at me. They're looking at me and they want, they want to know, well, who are you and what is it? Or the ones that know me, you know, because I'm a, I'm a great grandma now. I mean, and mm. uh, my great grandson, he is just a miracle. He, and he knows so much about what's coming. I wish that he's not really talking. I would like him to tell me what's coming, where are we going? But he's alive and he's, he loves, he just loves the world. And that's so mm. amazing because he was born in 2020. So he wasn't outside, he was yeah. inside. And then, and he comes out in 2021 and it's like, what's happening? And he just, he is so wide open for, for, for the conversation, whatever that conversation may be. He is, he is at the heart of it. And I was thinking about storytelling. And uh, mm. for me, you know, uh, it's like once you hear one story, it changes your relationship to that person. As well as working with incarcerated women, when I found the proper prompts, when I was able to get them to work, to write, to even admit when they couldn't write or they couldn't spell. And then my team would say, well, I'll help you. And to have to to feel the air get warmer, where the women were, they're moving in with other women, and they're sharing the fact that that where they've been and what they've done. And another one of uh, one piece of advice I give to incarcerated women, because some of them are like, you know, I don't want this is my business, you know, as black folks, you know, we ain't gonna be putting mm -hmm. up a business out in the street. And as I've gotten older, as the work has evolved, I've 
I've learned to say to the, the, to the most stubborn woman, I'll say, you know, somebody needs to hear your story. That's right. I said, you'd be amazed at the, the people that are in alliance with you, the people who have also suffered as you have suffered. And it's all mm -hmm. about, Sarah, it's about courage. You know, it's about telling, um, uh, sharing with my company, with the women inside and outside that, you know, uh, I, I heard someone say recently that courage is only um, fear with prayers. Mm. You know, and uh, and even the meditation that you just took us through, you know, it's like, you know, we have to be of great courage, mm. you know, and and tell the story. And that I was listening to um, Father Boyle the other night, the Homeboy Industries, and he reminds us that you have to come with love and kindness. You know, we are not here to judge each other. And uh, Brian Stevenson said, you know, we are all much greater than any any crime we may have committed. You know, mm. we are much greater than that. And I am learning that with my work with people on the inside and in the world that we're all I mean, together, you know, that's we're all right. together right down to, I remember what I, I no longer menstruate, you know, but I remember women would just feel like that was one moment we could say, girl, you got a spot on your skirt. And everybody would kind of move in to take care of me or whomever who had the spot on their skirt. But the community is just that rich and that varied and that organic, you know. That will you say are. more? Will you say more? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but because because I know that your story could just flow for the rest of the hour. I know. Um, and I won't interrupt you much, but I want but I want to ask, like, what is the role? Because I'm so curious about your take on this. Like, what is the role of storytelling? truth telling community support in this idea of abolition because i think it, it tends to be kind of esoteric for people mm. and and like to bring it into the ground like grounded practical nature i mean we've been doing work for decades in community to to you know i haven't called it abolition but i could call it that you know what mm -hmm. is storytelling and community building having to have to do with or it, what's that role well as artists and as activists, as an artist activist myself, I've been blessed to be in a space where I only have so much time, like the county jail or prisons across the world. And it's about practicing revolution. Mm -hmm. If you can get someone to stand up and say, this happened to me, this happened to me, I'm hurting, I am angry. And the other women in the room, I, I encourage them, place your hands on her. Mm. touch her, hold her. We make up the circle of living and knowing and being. And I know, it, like, as you say, it sounds so esoteric, but in the process of finding a story, the tears that flow, you know, I, I, I uh, one of my mentors used to say, when we'd all start crying inside, she'd say, okay, we're crying. We're going to have to stop crying. And then what we're going to do? And Mm -hmm. For for women who've been in lockdown, women who feel like they're outside of uh, this the, the 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 culture, they look at me like, well, what you, you want me to talk about what I'm gonna do? Do I have a role in this? And mm -hmm. I, for every woman who, for every woman who felt like she had nobody to show her the way, uh, it, it's Stevie Wonder, you know, show me how to do like you, and and I have perfected that in a lot of ways, and I tell women that theater saved my life but my kind of theater was about I wanted my story to be a part of the canon I wanted my story to be a part of the great American narrative I wanted mm. to be included and some people would say well why do you want to tell your age or why do you have to talk about race I said because I think all this is very rich it's and and as uh, um, your students were saying I'm here you know I am here and I'm not going anywhere you know and uh but everything that you ever thought I was, I'm here to say I'm not that. And at the same time, there's the there is a plea for a promise to be open to it, to love one. My mother would say, love one another, mm -hmm. forgive one another. And that sounds esoteric until you look deep into this black woman's eyes. And she was like, now look at here. You can't go around pointing fingers at somebody else. You've got to be willing to forgive, forgive others, forgive others. I mean, but what but how does that like? To me, I, I'm with you 100% because mm -hmm. I've been doing the work um, with young people who feel unforgivable, yes. right? 
And it's like, if, if we're not forgivable, then prisons are, are definitely not obsolete. Like they're, they're up and running. You know, like how do we, how does that, that balloon, how does, the, how does the work inside? Cause I didn't, I've done work with kids obviously that aren't in prison, although mm -hmm. Destiny Art mm -hmm. Center has programs for kids who are in jail. But, um, but what's it like to show women the access to their stories, access to their hearts, access to the possibility of abolition? Yeah, well, I think what, what I found is inside, you must break the rules. You see inside, we're, we're not allowed to touch each other really. But even when we get going as a group on the floor, we being Rodessa Jones and the inmates and, uh, and everybody's cooking, either we're laughing or we're crying or we're stomping around, we're angry. The deputies are leaning in as well because mm -hmm. there are women there who go, like, hmm, they remember, it nudges the memory. They remember a time before they were a cop, you know, or, the, or for all the times they've had to bury the, the sexual assault, the shame around that. And, and, and the way we, as you were talking about movement earlier, the movement is about simply running, jumping, dropping, rolling, scream, let a scream take you into the air. And the deputies, they're like, what the hell? But they're leaning in. And when I work in South Africa, it was the South African uh, guards, they're called, they're called wardens, but they, came up to me after a show at, at Pretoria at the State Theater, and they asked me, could you come back and work with us? Mm. We want to talk about where we've been and how it hurts for us. We want to talk about the abuse that goes on in our own homes. We're deputies with guns. Our husbands are too, but as women, we are still so oppressed. And could you come back and with dance and movement, storytelling, would you help us to open the way? And one woman said, I'm not afraid of my husband so much as he needs to know that I am, I am in pain, that I am grieving, that I, that I hurt, that he has hurt me. My children witness him hurting me. How, well, could you come back and, and create uh, scenarios, create movement, uh, movement stances that speaks to that kind of violence? And because they, they, they assured me that my work was really moving back to art, you know, back to making art. And they were saying, just the things you've done on stage with the women who've come down from um, Naturalina prison to be with us, we would love for you to work with us so that we could create stories and um, structures that our children could witness that would open them up to who we really are. You know, mm. so no, it's it, it's it is esoteric, but it's not as the artist. The artist has to move. You know, that's uh, right. Uh, oh, I can't think of her name at the moment. She's a sculptress, but she, Louise Nevelson. She said, "You know, it does not matter the medium, but we all must move. Mm. We must all move." And when I'm working inside, the the as the years have evolved, I have a great team of artists who go in with me. But in the beginning, I would just have everybody roll, just roll, roll across the floor, roll over each other, roll, make a pink pile, you know? And the women would just be giddy with the idea that, you know, it's before, before life hurt. And they, and again, the deputies are like, well, this is pretty amazing. We're not gonna stop her because for once the women are all like in accord they're standing with each other, they're, they're breathing, they are sweating together, and they, they have less fear about reaching out and touching another woman, you know? And, and I mean, that's I, so I, powerful, right? And, and, and you know what, I'm, I'm, Rodessa, because I'm like all in the conversation and I, I know your work, say just a, a slight, and I can show a video too if you want a, a just sort of visual for the audience here, but just say like what Medea Project is, um, you, you've been in prisons here in California, but, but also all around the world. So maybe just give us like a, uh, an intro now that we, we got the sort of inside <laughs> the scoop of it. <laughs> the Medea Project yeah. is a theater workshop that's rooted in storytelling as a way to explore our, our equal, but separate journeys, you know, uh, and, because I am an actress, I am a performer, theater saved my life. So I hand it to other people. And it's simply that 
I know this work because I am standing. Uh, you know, I, I was a mother before I was a woman, you know, and for a long time, I didn't feel like I had any place to be. I felt like I'd broken all the rules. I, I, or either I felt invisible at a very early mm -hmm. age. My, family, my mother and father were migrant workers. So we lived on the edge of culture. And at the same time, my mother would say, be a woman, don't be no dress. Mm -hmm. Say what you mean and mean what you say. And that's how she was. Even in the face of poverty and racial oppression, my mother would say to whomever, she, I remember her saying to a state trooper once, she said, you know, I'll get in your mouth and tell you you're wrong. She said, all you can do is take my life. She said, and I got 12 children here. So somebody's coming. And the cop is like, oh my God. And, but it was like, my mother, this is how my mother was teaching us to be powerful women. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we know that, that you know, as we look at uh, mass incarceration, and I'm constantly kind of pushing the envelope and saying, let's not forget all the women that, uh, that are in lockdown. I think it was, was it, well, somebody just said there's over a million women in prison, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and largely they're in prison because of implication, because right. they were in the wrong, they were in the, the wrong place at the wrong time. And nobody speaks for them. Uh, uh, our, our children are snatched away. They're all in lockdown. And it's like, I would say to women, we've got to stop this, y'all. We have got to take care of each other. We've got to take care of our children. Our mothers are getting too old. Our fathers are getting too old to pick up our children when we get busted and we're off to jail. And you've got to deal with whatever's causing you the pain. Let's look at it. Let's look at it so that you're not going out and nursing it with drugs and and I'm not going to pretend it's all going to stop, but at least as an art teacher, I, 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 bring it all, I bring it all to the table. What, mm. What's happening here? What are we doing here? Why are we doing this here? Why don't we try this here? You know, and they're just fascinated that I have so many different ideas, I think. It's like, wow, she's saying that. She's saying this. And I cry. You know, I have no problems with crying with them, you know. <laughs> And women have said, why are you crying for us? Mm. I, said, I said, you know, don't you think it's time for us to cry right now? We're going to have to Amen. stop crying in a minute. But don't you think it's the moment that we should all be uh, maybe just washing each other's, um, washing each other's wounds with our tears? Mm. You know, and and uh, this kind of poetry, which we may think is esoteric, but they're in a jail. They're in a gym in the jail. And I am like walking and talking that talk and touching them, touching their faces, their hair, remind them that they're beautiful anyway, you know? What a revolutionary act. I mean, it's it's like, I mean, Thank if we, we roll it into one small thing, like I, I've like just holding a child's hand, a uh, face in my hands. Yes. It's such a powerful act. It's like, it's like some longing inside of me wants that. And, and if that's the seed of abolition, like yes. if we see each other, you know, like, like the South African word for hello, I see you. Like mm. if we constantly see each other and then I see you, then God erase, you know, we, we have enslaved people who are from enslaved ancestry yes. and we're not seen, we're invisible. And yes. so then the flip side of I see you is don't look at me. Why, what you looking at? Yeah, yeah, you know? yes, yes. Like, exactly. don't look at me. And and to me, if we boil it down, because like, if we're in the practical and, and you're in dealing with and working with and, and loving on women who are incarcerated, who are absolutely invisible. And then mm -hmm. there's the young people, the black and brown young people that I've worked with who have been invisibilized. And yeah. we're saying, we're gonna boil it down to just seeing them and then allowing their stories to, to come and allowing them to grieve and allowing them to be joyful then, allowing them to be touched. So important. Um, yeah, and Diana, thank you for reminding folks. Please put your questions in the chat, the Q&A box. Rodessa, is this a good moment for This Is Not Your Mother's Theater Company video? Yes, let's, let's take a look at do you want to of, tell people the, about it or just want me to say this play it? Uh, uh, this is the late this is a little piece of the Medea project theater for incarcerated women HIV circles latest large uh, documentary our largest video and I when I was making this work 
when I was putting it together, we were doing, we were creating a, 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 a song inside the show and, and women were holding back on language and, you know, and because we're taught to be ladies, <laughs> you know, and I'd never say that, you know, and I had to scream and say, this ain't your mother's theater company, y'all. Come on, let's give give it up. Let's get real. <laughs> yeah, let, let's get real. Let's get real. And so that's what we're looking at now. Is that is the Medea project? What is it? 20, 30 years on now. And this mm -hmm. was uh, one of our latest pieces that we started making three or four years ago, but we've we've been presenting it most lately. Yeah. Beautiful. Here we go. This ain't your mother's theater company. I never thought I could break my own heart, but I have. Over and over again. Homeless, strung out, pregnant, stripper. Heart sick with the needle. I got a call from my doctor. She said, your HIV test is positive. Before I could scream and before I could shout, he laid me out, covered my mouth, and whispered, shut up, bitch. Who are these women? And what? What are they to you? To you? To you? There's a liberation that comes with finding your voice. They can come out about who they really are, what their fears are, what their angers are, they, what they have suffered, the journey that they've taken. I am healing the memories of being raped. Once I do my piece, I feel so relieved. I'm healing myself from the inside. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Invitation to the audience to breathe, y'all. Just yes. notice your breath. Um, <laughs> you know, whew, I mean, are these women now they're incarcerated, but they get to, to perform in public. And I remember coming to your performances in San Francisco and they had ankle anklets on or, yes. or they had like prison guards all around in the background, making sure that nobody left the building. What mm -hmm. is that like? Well, you know, the, the this group that you're looking at now, this is my whole company, and they're mm -hmm. made up of ex-offenders, offenders. offenders. Uh, but, but what happened with Mike Hennessy leaving, he was the sheriff of San Francisco County, and uh, uh, Donald Trump becoming um, president, all of a sudden, everything shut down. Mm -hmm. When Mike Hennessy was officiating all over the county, he understood that art changes lives. And he also understood how powerful it is that I think it's like the abolitionist way of if somebody can get up on stage and say a, a healing from being raped, we put rape in another category. Mm -hmm. And I always say to women, this ain't, this, ain't, this ain't your secret. This is somebody's garbage. And mm -hmm. let's take the power out of it. Let's take the power out of it. So, um, it's strange when I first started, it was so magical because I could not believe the sheriff, Mike Hennessy, I've been doing this now for almost 40 years, but Mike Hennessy heard me. He heard me and he saw me. And I went in and I said, I have an idea. And I said, all you artists out there, I have great ideas when I'm taking showers. <laughs> this came in the shower. I was like, I know what I want to do. I want to get these women to craft their own stories. And I want the sheriff's permission to put them on a public stage. And thank God for uh, Quentin Easter and Stanley Williams, who opened the Lorraine Hansberry Theater. And that was the first place that we started to perform with women coming, uh, coming from, the, uh, from the county jail in irons, in chains. And uh, it was so amazing because I'll tell you what, I love San Francisco. One of the most amazing things that happened was like when the sheriff said, okay, you can take them. We'll help you take them out of jails and into a public theater. I thought, I want, I want deputies. I want people who understand theater. I want people who understand art making. So I put up, a, I had all these auditions for for the uh, deputies, I said, I need deputies to come in. You're going to show me your fantasy. Show me your, your fantasy as a deputy. And they were like, for real? And I said, yeah. I said, come in with your baddest ass outfit on, your jumpsuit, your mirrored, your mirrored lenses, your gun. I said, and I want you to walk across stage. They were doing it. 
these are the, oh this is God. our citizenry. They were like, it's my turn now, <laughs> you know. The, and people would say, and I'd say, I want you to just say, stop, halt, stop, halt. Where are you going? I said, I want you to give it everything. I said, well, I want you to be fabulous. You know what I'm saying? Mm. So, this is the land of fabulosity. They were like, yes, you really want me to be fabulous? <laughs> I'd say, and I start, and I chose a whole group of uh, deputies. So they were also a part of the theater company because they had come in with the intention to make the most of the of this moment of being uh, of something other than just cops. But they were right. very much part of the theater company, and that was amazing. It was just amazing to. What was the impact on the the women when because these were like sort of like enemies in a way? I don't know. Maybe that's that's a fantasy. Well, for you me. know, back to our humanity. I mean. Mm -hmm. Uh, especially women, we are so forgiving, you know, we are so forgiving. And uh, the women who are, the women who are not, the women who are raging, lots of times they end up not making the cut to come outside because they, because they are so angry, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I felt bad about that. And, and I had a wonderful social worker um, Sean Reynolds, who was my mentor, and she would she would take women in hand and say, "Look, let's look at this. Why are you why are you mad at us? We're here with you, mm -hmm. and all that's going to happen if you go out there and start acting crazy. The police is going to lock you down and bring you back to jail. That's all that's going to happen. But uh, largely, the women were interested in the cops that wanted to be with us." They were like, uh, you know, and then, and then of course with Theater Rhino, there were, there were actually police officers who were involved with other theater companies in the city. So, mm. and so we had, we had a wonderful synergy around what is this? What is theater for incarcerated women? And everybody bought into it. And so it, it was pretty, it was pretty powerful. And uh, that became its own thing where the women were not allowed to, you know, the jails had already stopped smoking. You know, you couldn't smoke in the jails anymore, but the deputies that would bring the women down to Lorraine Hansberry Theater, they would let them stand in the alley and have cigarette breaks. Mm. You know, they just understood. They understood how tense it is to make art. And also, well, they're sort of free right now. So they should be able mm. to smoke. And all of this was coming into play and the women were watching it all. And I think, and I want to believe that it, it enhanced their connection with the with the with the whole piece, the the bonding that happened with all of us, from the sheriff saying yes, you can go do this, to the women, uh, the women really writing and working. And I found out that it wasn't so much about the women escaping that the cops were there. The cops would remind me that we're here to protect them because hmm. if we if we are not careful and somebody finds out that they're first of all. Uh, you know, in, in America, people got so indignant. Like, what do you mean? A taxpayer's money? These people are going downtown and having fun? You know, <laughs> this whole thing would happen. But the other side of that was that one of the uh, uh, deputy sergeants told me, he said, it's to make sure that nobody comes into the back of the theater and hurt anybody, which, mm -hmm. which as an artist, it gave me another challenge where I had to make art where all the women were on, on stage all the time. Wow. So the deputies could see them all the, and that's where the Greek myth came in. The Greek mm -hmm. chorus came in, you know, where you have women on stage all the time, but all of this stuff started to make sense. And we were having conversations with the police, with each other, with the public, especially when we opened the show and people, the last night of the show, the women could invite their families and the, the theater was open. The families got to come in for free. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you've got, You've got multitudes of people who haven't seen their mom or they haven't seen their auntie. And all of a sudden, their, their auntie, everybody's in a show, you know, mm -hmm. at, at this theater. And then, fa you know, fast forward to Africa. Africa was so brilliant because they would bring, at the marketplace in Johannesburg, if you got there, there were buses that would bring you out to the prison to, to see the show you know, wow. and it was all free. It was just all free. And they would just thrill that I was this, this American who, and who was, uh, who had, they thought I had, I said, well, I haven't really invented theater for incarcerated uh, people, but for women, I really had, I, I, I'd raised the bar a bit. So. Oh, it, not just a bit. Let's be real about that. You are weaving. It, it's almost <laughs> like as you're talking and you're telling all the stories and I mean, family in the audience, 
Rodessa can tell the story for like she has a million brilliant stories, and it feels to me like you're like it's this weaving of a web of abolition. It's like to to free our minds, to free our stories, to free our grief, to free the joy, to be in our bodies, to to have like to change the relationships between incarcerated people and and prison guards, ward wardens. Like yeah. we're shifting just this. It's like, it seems subtle, but it's monumental. I mean, that's what it feels like to me. I don't know if you want to show any more video what, what while we we're got? here. Let's, let's see what we got. Um, the pits, the pit arts, you want to show that one? Yeah, let's show, show some of this. this. This is my students. I love the University of Pittsburgh. The students were, they were so, they were so pumped about doing theater that was rooted in, in uh, incarceration. They were just pumped to be working and I, I took two of my artists with me, uh, uh, Felerine Bangalan, who is my dramaturg, and Felicia Skaggs, who is an ex-offender. And they both came with me and worked with me for that month. And the students mm -hmm. were magnificent. They were just magnificent. Mm -hmm. And they brought it all. They brought all they had to bear to the, to the creative uh, effort. It was wonderful. It was just wonderful. Yeah. And now you, this here is, these aren't incarcerated folks. These are folks that are just, these are students um, the on university. Campus. Yes, and, this is and a, they're tapping in, and that's another part of the weaving, right there. Yes, it's they like, want they wanted to pee. It's like you're not people. distant. You're not distant yes. from it. You're connected. We're not. We're not like throwing them away. No, we're bringing and, and them they closer. Were, and what impressed me was that they were really so, and they wanted to engage. They wanted mm. to get it. They were actors. They were writers. They were, you know, they were dancers. They were singers. But they wanted to, they wanted to embrace theater for incarcerated women as its own medium, and they just brought it. They brought it for us. Yeah, it was wonderful. Right on. Let's see yes. these youngins do their thing. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Come on, young people. <laughs> <laughs> theater saved my life, for real. I am Rodessa Jones, and I'm an artist, activist, performer. I'm a uh, teacher of social activism. So here at UPIT, I have been actually working with a group of very special students. We've had a great time in developing ways and means of telling the truth and practicing revolution and getting people to, to hear their inner voice and then to speak it out. We're the only one who Idris Akamore and I, we have traveled all over the world together as a duet, Jones and Akamore, performance music. I'm free within my grave. Our motto is, we are in search of human culture. Where do we all enter? Where can we all be a part of the circle? A fireplace glows, and the only sound, bubbly storches, gurgling, boiling to the dancing flames. If it had not been for theater in America, if I had not found the place to lay it down, if I had not found the place to talk about what meant something to me, it's so important that you find a way for these people to have voices, especially women. So it, so it began 20, 30 years ago, of what, it, what kind of methodology could I use to get women to to say, this hurt me, this happened to me, I'm angry about this. And then I'm surrounded by these incredibly intelligent young people who want something else. I wanted to find my place in the world, cause honey, I've seen a few things and a few things have seen me too. And I wanted to share those with the world. And it was through the looking glass of theater that I found the space to be. So coming to Pitt, here I had, uh, these students who had done musical theater, most of them are writers, and I gave them this opportunity to, to enter the space and share all those things with a different slant, you know, with a different kind of subject matter. It was the pinnacle of a certain kind of performative action with the Medea Project. The piece has always had a dancer. She said, I'll dance, but at first she was very timid. I didn't know she was a ballerina. I would just let her do her thing. It was stunning. And all around her, everybody from Fifi to Jeff to all of these performers, everybody's giving it their all. And she's a quiet little action, 
but she's a very active action. They were gorgeous, and um, they were ancient, and they were childish, and they were impish, and, and we had a ball. It was like being in a cage with a bunch of little baby lions and tigers and everything. It was really, and at the same time, we're singing, and we're talking, and we're, we're telling the truth. They, they, it was, there were lots of tears, too. They've been trained to listen, to exchange, to make notes. They're very respectful of each other. I've enjoyed that here at this university, definitely. That, that there's a deep respect and love for each other. Everybody just gave, everybody gave a lot. And that is amazing. You oh. know what I love so much is seeing that ballerina, the shy ballerina, who had all that leg yes. and, and then the theater people behind her and as a trained dancer like there was something it's sort of like this separate thing between the the diva dancers and the theater people that are you know good at text but but they can't get their leg up and they don't belong together they don't belong. and it's like putting things that quote unquote don't belong together mm -hmm. that's a revolutionary act too yes. like just to watch her throw her leg up while there's people back there feeling like with their bigger bodies and their and they were like there was dignity in yes. all of them and connection and collaboration like that's what I love like I have kids um at Destiny big girl there's big girls mm -hmm. you know just all different size shape colors like to me bring them all together because they all can they all have a story and and if there's discipline and and rigor connected you know in not discipline in a mean way but discipline as in a rigorous way Right. They get good at their craft, no matter what they look like. So, and it's about honing that. And there was this one big girl in, in my company um, who, after a performance, she killed it. And after a performance, the audience member came up to her and was like, thank you for repping for the big girls, you know? And she was like, oh, I don't think of myself as a big girl. I just think of myself as a dancer. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> I was like, my job is done. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, and you know, when you think about the history of the shaman, you think about uh, the rituals of our existence and they all had singing and dancing. The whole village the, you know, would be there to, to lift somebody up, to bury somebody. And, they, and I felt like these students, they, uh, they were having this great opportunity to come together and bring all of their craft. And then we actually, you know, that we actually end up going into uh, a prison and working with men in a prison. And that was about mm -hmm. eight or nine uh, young women that went in with me. And they were amazing, too. They were just amazing with the guys. They were just amazing with, uh, you know, with uh, I give I give them uh, two people over here. I say, you know, you're going to work with them because by the end of the day, we're going to do a performance. And everybody just stepped up to they stepped up to all that they knew and all that they were willing to open and know. You know, and it was wonderful. It was just wonderful. I mean, I wonder, like, just because when you said that, like, we're gonna at the end of the day, you're gonna perform. <laughs> like, I think about, like, I brought up rigor and discipline, and we talked about this the other day. But, but it's like we're talking about freedom here. Yes. And I, and for me, for me, freedom. It's sort of like you know, Spider Man. Like, with great freedom comes great responsibility. You know, mm -hmm. that's sort of kind of the underpinning of the work that I did at Destiny. It's like how do you maintain a rigor? And, and rigor doesn't mean like, you know, just the sit-ups and the push-ups. It also means like if somebody is unkind to you to, to point it out in a kind way. Yes. If someone drops something, pick it up for them. You know, they yes. left it, pick it up. If yes. there's an opportunity to connect with someone that requires a push for you, take that opportunity. You know, there's so many ways that, that discipline is connected to to freedom, say something about that relative yeah, well, to it, the work it, you have. You must, you must come with, it's almost holy, this whole idea that mm -hmm. we are all a part of this great, the, the great one, you know, mm -hmm. for lack of a better, a better term. And I found like with, on, in the academia, coming in with theater for incarcerated women and working with the dance department, the drama department, you know, uh, they have never had this opportunity. 
and they want to sh they want to shine and they want to shine for me and they want to like make it make sense you know for another thing was the men all the men that i got to work with on college campuses because when mm -hmm. i go into a prison it's largely women but the men were there and the women you know the women were so eager to see what the guys would make happen you know mm -hmm. and uh, at and at auburn state prison I did a, uh, I brought in a piece that a woman had written about, I was the baby. And it was about her abuse at the end of her, her, uh, her alcoholic mother. And uh, so we read this piece and it's one white man. And then there's six black men. There's four older black men, OGs. And this kid says, this is my story. This is what happened to me. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, how are we going to put this on this? How are we going to put this on the floor and perform it? And one of the older guys said, daddy's home is the song we're going to sing. And they mm -hmm. could sing, they could jam, they could just jam. And the, the young man who spoke largely most of the piece, he was in tears half the time. And I'd say, you know, we got it. We got to, we got to lift him up, hold him up. And they just knew, they just knew how to go over Come on, bro. Come on, bro. We can do this, bro. You know, and this young white man is sobbing. He said, "But this is my story." And they're saying, "We got you. We got you." And the, and one older man said, "But it ain't only your story, you know. But but uh, but God bless you for putting yourself out front and saying this was my story." And they're saying, uh, uh, is, "Is that all right, Miss Jones?" And I said, "Yes." And I'm just standing back, bearing witness. Because mm -hmm. the, here we are in prison, men are in prison forever. And all of a sudden in, in the space of theater, there's this incredibly unique respect for each other and a, humans, uh, a human sense that we are all in this together and our pain, pain is so real for all of us, you know, for mm -hmm. all of us. And at the same time, the older, the older black dudes are saying, we got you, we got you little brother, we got you. You know, and uh, and the guy said, "Man, sometimes you just got to cry." And this was, on, these no. were men; these were men, and 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 out and inside of that, they, there was such a rigor on all of our parts because the warden came down. We were making so much noise; we were having so much fun that all of a sudden, <laughs> one of the persons who had invited me in, she says, "Don't look now, but the warden is over there standing <laughs> by the door. He's just wondering what's happening." I said, "Let's let it rock. Let's roll. Let's roll." And he was like. He came to me and said, who are you again? <laughs> he said, I've never seen them be so calm and so mm -hmm. caring for each other. There's not a, he said, there's no air of danger in this room. I said, darling, mm -hmm. we're making art. We're making art. You know, maybe some havoc, but we will dress up havoc. You know, we can dress <laughs> havoc up, man. But, no, but I, I guess it's the humanity of it. I think, I think you understand it. I understand it. It's I, I love theater for the 21st century because it puts the it puts the 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 um, the artist at the center. It puts the the advocate at the center. It puts all of these uh, people such as ourselves who come with a larger agenda than just making prize winning work. Of course, anybody right. right now and see the work and it's like, wow. But it's it's the whole idea that this, too, is very much a part of the great American canon as we move forward. Yeah. I really love that you keep saying that because I think it's like continuing to claim the power of this work because if if we see community-based art and storytelling and revolutionary theater as peripheral to the 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 canon then then we're lost. Like to me that's part of the rigor. It's like I mean one of the questions actually is what motivates you? What motivates you? to continue doing the work 40 years, for me, 30 years, but for, for you, 40 years of this work, what keeps I, you doing it? Well, I think it's because I am constantly seeking peace and mm. happiness and a beauty. And it doesn't have, to, I'm not talking frifer frifer. I'm talking about the beauty of this experience. This, you know, if I can find a, a, um, an inmate who, I can open that up and the artist comes forward, but the artist is just there to open our hearts and to remind us that we all bleed. I talked to, uh, to women about this all the time. I said, you know, let us all agree that all women bleed. And they're like, ooh, Miss Jones. I said, no, 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 in this case, we bleed, but we're not just like, we're not menstruating. We're, we're opening our hearts, our heads, and we're like trying to take away this uh, these facades that the society part of, 
abolition has to do with getting rid of these facades. Let's make room for the truth. Let's make mm -hmm. room for, for uh, a new uh, in, in a Simone song. There's a new world coming, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanna be a part of that. And back to your question, I've never found so much peace any other place other than making art and particularly making art in these, these, uh, these places that nobody would have thought 30 or 40 years ago. But I, I am seeking a calmness. I want to make a different world for my great grandson. You know, yes. I, I want to, when I'm moving through the world, when I get to work with, with young men, which I don't do as much, I like to move among them and just say, you know, you're so powerful. You're so beautiful. I say to, I said to one young man, I said, you look just like your mother. I said, I've never met your mother. And he's like, ma'am. I said, but right now when you're so focused, you look just like your mother. And he says, you know, I got, I've got to like reach out to my mom. I've been mad at my mom. I said, but your mother gave you this gorgeous face, baby. I said, I'm nothing else. He's like, for real? I said, for, and all the people, all, everybody's not there wondering what they look like. It's like, well, what do we look like? I said, but you know, know that somewhere she's probably praying for you, you know? Mm. And there's like, wow, that's deep. And I said, is it, is it just human? You know, back to what we're doing with us. But it's deep now. But it's deep <laughs> now because it's re we're removed from that. We're, if we're removed from that, then we can put people in, in cages. And that's why I keep saying, I keep bringing up the practicality of abolition. It's mm -hmm. like, I mean, it's steady work. I mean, it's a lifetime of work to, mm -hmm. to, to instill in young people and women and the men that you've worked with to continue to let them know that they're beautiful. And yes. if you know you're beautiful and then you know that you're you're connected and that beauty is connected to your mother or your father or yes. your, your ancestors in some way, then you belong to somebody. And if you belong yes. to somebody, how can you how can you can you can you hold somebody captive? You know, it's like cracking us open. I don't know if you want to show any of the birthright um, documentary piece. Do we I have time? Make sure. Um, yeah, we have uh, Gina said that who's who's managing the questions. She said there was one question, which was the one what motivates you. Um, I wonder if you want to show a little segment of it and then we if folks have questions. Birthright is interesting because the Planned Parenthood reached out to the Medea project mm. and they wanted to work with us. They wanted to they wanted to actually team with us because of, you know, because of what was going on in Congress with it all being taken away from us. And, and, they, and they were saying to me, they were saying to me, how can we impress upon the women that they are a part of this too? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I had the pushback from some women who said, well, I don't want to do this if Planned Parenthood has anything to do with it because they're just about killing babies. I said, are they? And then it was the women with HIV who said, oh, wait, 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 wait. It was through Planned Parenthood that I found out I was HIV positive. It was through Planned Parenthood mm -hmm. where I got I got money to, to help me to buy the medicine. It was through Planned Parenthood. I got a, a look at a different kind of diet. And, and all of a sudden they're being educated about this 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 particular system, Planned Parenthood. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um it, it it's been an interesting birthright has been an interesting ride. Yeah, just uh, getting women to and to talk to the nurses, to talk to the doctors, to talk to the people who run the Planned Parenthood offices. Yeah, so let's just so this is a documentary that people can see. It's called Birthright. Is Birthright. It yeah. Yes. Birthright. Yeah. And and large, they're all on uh, uh, YouTube. You know that people right. can go to YouTube and see them. Yeah. So we'll show an, an excerpt now, and you just like wave your hand when you when you think it's okay. done. Okay. <laughs> when you think the excerpt is done, <laughs> I'm going to start from the beginning. Okay. Okay. All right. Here we go. Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood. Did anybody mention anything about a Planned Parenthood? <gasps> Honey, I love me some Planned Parenthood. I was incarcerated in the San Bruno County Jail and Rodessa came out into the jail and they were doing a play and I knew a lot of girls in the jail. So I was like, I didn't want to stay in a dorm. So I would go out and see what this was about. 
And I went out and I've been there ever since. It's been 24 years. You know how we all like that alcohol and have to get to the liquor store by 2 o'clock? Yeah. Well, back in the day, me and my girl, hey. we had to be at Planned Parenthood by 4.30 to get them condoms. Hey. You know what I'm talking about. Them condoms. The dress rehearsal. I was standing back there. I got really, really emotional. You know, it's just something just magical about uh, on my way to walking out on the stage. I just love it. <laughs> What am I? Who and what have I become? I never thought I could break my own heart. But I have, over and over again. I never thought I would be doing anything like this. Never entered my mind that I would be doing anything like this. I broke my own heart when I let a man do things to me that I really didn't want him to do. It was like I was in a nightclub, like, and I was just like I was singing the blues, telling the story. But you see, I was on drugs, and he was supplying. I got pregnant, had an abortion, and he od Who are these women? And what? What are they to you? To you? To you? She's our mama. She's your lover. That woman's the woman who's going to carry your child. Oh, they wear my mother's face. My sister. My daughter. Oh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, you know, mm. what I loved about uh, Birthright was women coming out talking about abortion talking about their drug addictions, you know, mm -hmm. in the in the space of a, of a stage. You know, again, like ab abolition, it's like, let's get rid of all the shame and the weight of it all, because these are, these are things that largely we've all been through, right down to the rape and all this kind of stuff. And, and for, for a woman to find her way to the stage and say, okay, over here, I'm gonna tell you the truth now about my life. And because with with the truth comes a a, a a dizzy a dizzying freedom, you know it's just it's so dizzying dizzying to me to watch mm -hmm. women that I, I start working with and by the end they want to talk about where they have been, and and then if it's about um, abortion if it's about Planned Parenthood they want to they want to assure us all that they are part of this too, that mm -hmm. it isn't over here. It is a it is a system, a social system that has really, really been there for all women. And we and I would say to them, we have to protect our right to decide when and how we can keep a baby, have a baby or not have a baby. That's our right. You have a right to a life, you know. And I wonder, I wonder, like, what does it mean? Because now it's they're trying to strip all of that away. Oh. They're trying to. And, and what is that? I mean, my my theory is, you know, hetero patriarchy and white supremacy are coming down mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and on the way out they're like no 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 we're going to come for the women again we're going to come for your your body we're going to come for the gays we're going to come from we're going to come for you you know we're going to come for the trans people who just are getting their voices we're going to come for you now because we don't want to go down right i mean to me that sense of dizzying freedom like like you don't even know what to do with it Mm -hmm. that's what we that's what we have to keep barreling towards to you know like what fighting. motivates us the vision of that the understanding that that exists yes, and that it, we deserve it and protecting our freedom especially here in this mm. great democracy you're going to tell me that i don't get to decide you know what's happening to me you know mm. and, and reminding women that we cannot shrink and go oh well you know, but Cornel West said something. I heard him speak and he said, we have to be careful because even black folks, we have like, we have, we have sort of ingested white supremacy, you oh, know, yeah. that somehow that these people know something that we don't know, 
you know, or they have they have a more of a right to tell us what to do. And I and one of the things I love about being in lockdown with women is that we we just go off. We we have something called a kicking dance. And I just <laughs> say, you know, you got to fight for your life. You got to fight for your life. The, decide whoever it is out there in front but take them down. And that's the congressman, that's the rapist, that's the abusive husband, take them down. And they say, you mean, we just, we can just like, we can get, we can wild out. I said, let's wild out. And I said, the next time you're in a garage or you're parading or you're demonstrating in front of the White House, lose your mind lose your yes. get other women to lose their minds too and make the men come in too you know because we have a right to a life you know yeah mm. come on yeah. everybody in the audience just take a breath <sighs> because this sister right here is the real deal and and i think like I think of my, one of my spiritual teachers says, you don't come to to your meditation or to the chanting or to, to the spiritual practice to be comfortable. You yeah. come to remove the obstacles to your freedom. So when I'm thinking, when I'm hearing you say, just wild out, like just, <laughs> just go big or go home because we don't, we can't shrink. No. You know, it's like that, like when you even went like this, it's like you, you dropped out of your screen. It's like, we cannot shrink. Yes we yes, have right. to embody our fullness and that's why i always have people uh, meditate and move because mm -hmm. our bodies are a part yes. of liberation right yes. if we're just up here mm -hmm. to me that's white supremacy that, and it doesn't have to be white people it's whiteness it's a whiteness white, yes isn't and that good and uh, i and when i'm working with women inside san francisco's uh, uh, city jail has a, a great gym they have this mm -hmm. huge gym in the middle of the jail. And I, when I, when I got into my third or fourth year, it was about learning how to do cartwheels. It was like learning how to stand on our hands. It was like learning how to carry another body. And women would say, well, well this is so weird. I said, no, it, what, if nothing else, let it empower you. You don't know where the war might begin and you've got to get mm -hmm. your comrades out of the way. And they're like, for real, Ms. Jones? I said, imagine it, that you've got to get somebody out of the line of fire. Can you do it? Can you do yes. it? Yeah, so yes. I mean, that practice, we could all do that practice. That's like a meditation. I have a question actually from John. He says, can you speak to us in this? I think this might be our final piece, but you don't know. It might be a quick answer. I don't know okay. about that. Let's okay. Rodessa. You yeah. had too many years under your belt. Can you speak to us how your art and community can serve us as a model for abolition and community safety? I, I have a big mouth. <laughs> you have to have, you have to you have to be you have to be you have to be brave you have to be courageous you and and our and our, and our children they're looking for it show me how to do like you do show me how show me how give me permission to roll mm -hmm. with it like the children in the airport that that day you know it's uh that is what i feel like sometimes when the when the when the pandemic first started and I, I live in Noe Valley here in San Francisco. And uh, okay, we have our mask and I go up to Safeway and, and there's like all the, all of the young, well, not young, but all the white folks, they're kind of like grumbling because this one woman, this older woman has filled up her shopping cart with all of the toilet paper. Mm. Everybody's like, she's going to go. And I, and I had to go into my actor. I, had, I said, okay, okay, actor, come on out. I, I walked, that's a girl. And she turns and looks at me. I said, "Bro, you can't have all this toilet paper." And everybody's like, "They're like, oh, maybe the black woman's gonna save us." I said, "No, no, 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 honey." I said, "You can have two. And she's like, oh. "I said, no, all of these people, we all need toilet paper." And I said, "Is that not right, y'all?" They're like, "Well, oh, yeah. yeah, you know." But it was just this wonderful moment in the supermarket where everybody like, oh. We go, we're going to all, and, and you know, I was like actually acting, but it was such an amazing moment to stop this one. I said, I said, girl, don't be so selfish. I said, you know, we all got to share now. I said, they're locking us down. And everybody's like, yeah, they're locking us down. You've got to wake up to that fact. And I said, I said, but you know, like, you know, don't get on her. At least she was going to buy, get her toilet paper. I said, no. I said no. <laughs> and she ended up smiling at me slightly, but it was like, I'll say, oh my God, who was that? <laughs> this one man goes, oh, uh, thank you very much. I said, I said, thank you for well, playing the game. 
I said, so we all got some toilet paper. <laughs> yeah, we all got some toilet paper. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's I, such a that's such a powerful. I mean, <laughs> unpack that audience. That's that's a powerful <laughs> lesson. There's another question um, from Mackenzie. Now they're starting to pop in. Um, do you think it's important to express your hurts to the people who hurt you, or just to let the feeling out of you in some way? I think it's it cuts both ways. I think it. I think sometimes you don't even have to name names because they know who they are. Mm. But I think you have to be willing to say, "This hurt me. This hurt me." Or you know that I was gang raped. I mean, I've had women talk about being gang raped, mm. and that whole thing of like, uh, and one girl had said that her brother had been one of the people that he just thought was funny, that she was stalked by these other guys. And she said, I was able to go to my grandfather and tell my grand, and, I, and she said, at first mm -hmm. my grandfather was like, what you mean? She says, and she says, I told him that Sidney, my brother had been a part of it. And he called his, his son and he said, what is this? He said, what, what is this? What, what, what is this? What does she ever do to you? This is your blood. He said, and not, not to mention women all over the world, we, they don't need this. And I think it was, I think it was just simply, I think you have to be able to call it. You have to be able to say it out loud for the for your own sake. You know, mm. this happened to me. I was mm. wounded this way, you know, and, uh, and, uh, but, but don't, but again, it's courage. It's just simply courage. Mm -hmm. And I think you do have to call people out when you can. When I was at Stanford, I did a big workshop at Stanford many years ago when I first started this work. And that was a wonderful uh, professor of, of a therapeutic uh, uh, learning there. And he said, um, he said to us as activists, he says, whenever anybody comes to you and they're brave enough to tell you that something scald them, something broke them. He said, the first thing you do before anything is to say, I am sorry. He mm. said, practice saying that. I'm sorry this happened to you because so many people don't hear it from anybody, least of all the, the teacher or even in their family. He said, but it gives people a place to stand. It gives them a sense of, uh, of uh, agency. If, uh, if you as the, as the professor or the art leader who has in, initiated this, this action, if you're the first to say, my God, I'm sorry that happened to you. Are you all right? Are you getting any help for it now? And I do that, I do it all over the place. I do it in the airports. I do it everywhere when, I, when I'm sharing stories with people. Yeah. Wow. I mean, and the power of an apology yes. is so potent. And I think, I mean, I have a theater exercise that I do where you walk around and you mill around a room mm -hmm. and somebody comes before you and they're like, I apologize. Mm. And then it's like building the muscle of the apology. And it's not apologizing for yourself, like in a, in a beat yourself up type of way. So we have, yeah. we have to find the difference, right? So what you're saying is mm -hmm. claiming your hurt. Yes. And, and if the apology comes, amen, you know, but if you're, if you're accountable and, and in a way, accountability, and we're talking about abolition, accountability has come just, you get locked away. But, but you don't even get to be truly tenderized by yeah. the, the, the way that, that an apology, a true authentic apology mm -hmm. leaves you. I, I mean, I've had moments where I've apologized and people have you know said all kinds of stuff and I'm like, I am so sorry. And from a place of like a grounded place, a centered place. And my chest was like a pool of water mm -hmm. of just love. Like, because we're human, we all make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so how do we meet each other there? You know, meet yes, me and in my humanness. Well, I, I often talk about the, 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 uh, the pain that shapes you will show, mm. you know, and I've said to women, okay, uh, let's, let's go there. Let's go, let's go. When, when you came to yourself and you had been left in this abandoned building and, and your body had been battered, what was the part that you held on to? And they go, ooh, and I go, ooh. I said, girl, you just told me about a mass rape or whatever, and I was like, ooh. I said, let's, let's hold our crotches, let's hold our breasts, and let's move, let's move across the stage in, in this way and see what happens, see what we can find. And mm -hmm. the other side of that is, uh, you know, there's this wonderful book, um, the, uh, the Body Keeps Score, 
you know, mm -hmm. you know this book? Mm -hmm. And that was another book that we used a lot that the, the body keeps score. The body will, the body will tell on you, even if you won't tell on yourself. And I mm. said, I tell people, I tell women how, how magnificent the human body is, because this is mm. what happens. This is what happens, even if we're having terrible uh, cramps or, or there, there are women that one woman that I work with, she's been thrown out of so many windows as a, as a, you know, a, a, a person who is, she's come, she's come through the crack addiction, but she was just this target. She's tiny and mm. she would just be thrown out of windows. And the goddess is great. She said, she'd always be, she'd always end the, land in a, hand she got my or, she, you know, she would, she'd crawl out of some dumpster, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, the, the whole idea that, and the last man that, that actually hurt her he used to bite her she her lover they'd have fights and he'd bite her mm. she would be arguing with him and he'd get close enough and he'd bite her and you know and then but she told us she said but she said it was really bad what happened I said what happened she said she went to jail got out of jail he was out of jail she asked his friend what happened and his friend said didn't you hear he was killed by a spider bite yeah, okay <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I wish we had all day to talk because the stories, I'm going to invite Gina to come on the camera because okay. she has one final question, but that's spider story, fam. <laughs> <laughs> that's wild, isn't it? Really? Yes. Ooh, that's accountability on another level <laughs> okay. right there. Oh, uh, you know, you, you never know. My mother used to say, if you're going to walk, <laughs> if you're going to walk right, you better walk right because you're always walking in the light and you don't know who's watching. Hey, no, no. hey, yes, 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 Gina, Gina, take us out. <laughs> well, I just want to, I want to thank both of you for such a delightful evening. And uh, I want to thank you both for your work and Radessa for all of these years doing this incredible project. I mean, I hope our audience really understands how innovative, how incredibly brave this project was and, and how important it is, especially that you started with women inside mm -hmm. because uh, women inside have been a neglected population. Mm -hmm. So much of our focus has been in the work, even before the contemporary abolition movement on, on men inside. And we need to, of course, be focused on them. But of course, women were really suffering without visitation, without programming, without opportunities. And so thank you so much for this work. Um, I, I do want to uh, give you a chance to ask answer this one last question that came in it came in from Erin Washington and Aaron, I love her <laughs> and she says love you bro uh can you talk about how the south influenced your work the south the southern part of the United States that's, I think that, that's what it means <laughs> yes I will I you know um I was raised by uh, a very very powerful southern black woman and I also was raised in a time when you didn't talk back, even if you had, even if you had an opinion, you did not, it was disrespectful to push the envelope. And uh, the, the South always sort of, you know, when, when we left, my mother wanted us to leave because she felt like it was, that my mother's husband had been lynched. My mother had been taken to lynchings, my, but it was like the boogeyman. My mother would say, you know, you better pay, you better pay attention to what I'm saying to you. You better pay attention because because they're out there. Mm -hmm. And my and her father was chased away by the patty rollers. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I'm glad that I grew up in that environment, you know, because I ain't no fool fool. You know, it's like, uh, you know, I know how to listen to the night. I know how to listen to the energy around me and I am just so glad that I was, I'm a Floridian, I'm a Southern girl. And uh, there is something rooted in that, that has, that has played a large part in who I am. And it's about, like, again, all the things that what we have been talking about, Sarah and I, you know, being respectful, being aware of each other, seeing each other. The South did a lot of that for me, where just as black, just as a black woman in the South, you know, it was just like, I learned early on to see, to really see mm -hmm. and to hear as far as like what was going on, despite the, the nightmare and the nightmares, uh, the living mayors were horrible, you know, mm -hmm. and my mother lived through them. 
and it was still a gracious person. My mother was still like incredibly gracious to everyone, but she saw such terrible castration and, you know, and babies being, you know, my mother just saw babies being shook out of uh, pregnant bodies. And, and these were her neighbors. And she still, mm -hmm. she still was this grand lady and anybody that crossed her threshold, she would mm -hmm. offer them something to eat. She was interested in who they were. And I used to wonder, mom, how did you do it? Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, largely it was uh, back to what Aaron's question it was also the Southern church, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a heathen now, you know, I'm a spiritualist, but you know, in those <laughs> days, the Southern church, again, love one another, you got, and you got, you got to forgive one another and you got to ask God to forgive you. And Martin Luther King said, hate is too much. It is too much to bear. Mm -hmm. We cannot bear it. You know, we cannot bear it. Yeah. Ooh, that oh. is the final word. We Absolutely. cannot bear the hate. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. so Lean into the have, love. Have ended on such a in such a beautiful place. And, and of course, you know, we hope that people will be able to have this strength going forward that comes from this tradition, but without so much of the suffering. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I'm looking at you and thinking about all that you have given to generations and and how much it's going to be so important for us to move forward with that strength but to also recognize that we don't have to make each other suffer yes. and we don't have to suffer ourselves to find it. So thank you. Thank you for the gift to our audience. Thank, thank you for being you. with us. Thank you. And we wish you the very, very best. Yes, as thank well so to much. everyone. Be Blessings well. Blessings to all. Be well. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much for having us. And Rodessa, you the bomb. Thank you, Sarah. It's like, <laughs> we gotta have our own talk show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.